do. What I want to talk about today is, is to try and understand, first of all, what, um, what happened with Black Lives Matter and what might happen, what could happen. Rather, what didn't happen, yes. and how it happened, and what it tells us about modern protest movements uh, uh, in general, and the state of play when it comes to race in Britain in particular. And I'm going to start with a story about a, a march, a, a demonstration that I went on in um, Hackney in London, where I live, in June 2020. So it must have been two or three weeks after George Floyd had been murdered. And um, we, we went to this place, there must have been about 300 or 400 of us. It was a very local march, there was a lot of people in an area where I've never seen a demonstration, it was a demonstration on a march, I've never seen a demonstration. Um, before in that area. Um, there were lots of people that I knew, but there were also lots of people that I didn't know. There was um, <clears throat> um, there was a very poor sound system, which meant you couldn't really hear anything that was being said. Um, and we, uh, it was, for many of us, it was our first time out. <laughs> Lockdown. And at one stage we took a knee um, um, <clears throat> and then we, uh, I think we took a knee and we raised a fist at the same time. So a kind of uh, mashup of anti-racist symbols there. And, um, and in many ways, and then we went home, that demonstration to me illustrated a particular and peculiar unfolding of the 20 rebellions and the broader nature of the situation we find ourselves in now with regard to social movements and the challenges of this current moment. Because I I found about, I think my wife told me about this demonstration, she came too, but it's not clear how she knew about it and it was probably on social media, through social media, it must have been actually because we weren't we weren't actually kind of um, we weren't allowed to mix physically, um, so we just knew somehow that it was on, and apparently that was the same for many of the others. Many friends who I didn't know were going until I saw them there, and through its informal and impermanent those networks that social media creates daily, it could kind of convene people at short notice. It was a very, the, the protest was very symbolic, taking a signifier from the 60s and raised clenched fist in the Black Power movement, and then the bent knee of the uh, American footballer Colin Kaepernick, and then doing that for eight minutes, which was the amount of time that George Floyd was being um, aggressed and murdered. And then we disbanded. Nobody took our names, nobody took any names. Uh, never really to be convened again. I don't know how that group of people came together, and I don't know how you could ever get them back together again. So it happened for a moment. And it, it, in that moment that you're walking back, you're wondering, well, well I was wondering, what, what was that about? And how does one harness the energy of that moment? How do you direct it, um, convene and cohere it? What we saw in 2020, I think with Black Lives Matter, is a vivid example of the potential and pitfalls in modern activism. What drives them? How they emerge, burn brightly, and then fade only to re-emerge again. So we're now coming up to three years after the protests erupted and I think it makes sense to reflect on whether they shifted the dial with regard to racism in this country at all and if so how. 
Was it just a moment of protest that erupted and evaporated? Fleeting memory of a point in time that has now passed. A wave we surfed for a short while, only to see it crash and ebb without trace. Or did it bring forth a movement of anti racists that will sustain the struggle against white supremacy for years to come and bring change to the institutions that perpetuate inequality? As statues fell, major corporations and institutions put out statements condemning racism. People blacked out their Instagram pages, and England footballers took the knee. Um, <clears throat> but arguably, or were these changes, were they only symbolic and performative and skin deep, skin deep? Or did it force a substantial reckoning with racial inequalities in the country? Inequalities that leave black infant mortality twice as high as white, black boys significantly more likely to be excluded, and so on, and so forth. Was it a moment, a movement? Did it primarily rely on symbol or substance? How do we understand the events of that summer? And what can it tell us about where we are now? Now, I don't have any definitive answers to those questions. I just think that they are good questions to ask. Um, how, in any case, do you describe a moment that arguably you are still in? How do you assess a story that's not yet finished? But I think that we can approach the questions by first looking at what happened. Now, I want to start with at the beginning with the killing of George Floyd, because the sight of Floyd being killed in real time was shocking, but the news of it was not shocking. There aren't more black people being killed by the police in America right now. There were just more people paying attention to police killings. It's not getting worse. It was always this bad. His death at the hands of police doesn't contradict what we think and know about relations between African Americans and the police. It confirms them. Now, the precise alchemy that made his death, as opposed to so many others, so totemic, is unclear. But it was precisely because it was emblematic of a broader systemic issue that so many could be galvanized around that singular incident to such effect. So there is a latent political community, there must have been, for that moment to trigger what it did. An unconnected group of people who are ostensibly either dormant but can be galvanized, or who are ostensibly dormant but could be galvanized into action. Whether these are people waiting for leadership around an issue about which they've thought a great deal, but have found no way to intervene in, or whether it's people converted from ambivalence to passion by a single event is an important and interesting question, but not one I'm going to pursue here. Suffice to say, they were largely roused from inaction to some kind of action. <laughs> the world didn't change. Our understanding of the world changed. And then as a result, people set about trying to change the world. And as such, they reminded me of a conversation I had in Spain in 2011 while reporting from The Guardian. And when I asked a class at an unemployed training centre, I was in Madrid looking at uh, the politics of youth in Spain. And I was in a training centre in Madrid um, and I asked the class who would be prepared to immigrate to find a job and they all raised their hands. At that time youth unemployment in Spain stood at 43 percent, higher than both Egypt and Tunisia. Everyone in the room said most of their friends were unemployed. One in five Spaniards under the age of 30 were still looking for their first job. Almost every young person I spoke to believed that their lives would be harder than their parents. I spoke to a, uh, the author of the country's most popular political blog, blog Ignacio Escola, who said this is the least helpful, best educated generation in Spain. Why then, had I, I asked him, had they not taken to the streets? Well, he said, it's like there's oil on the ground. All it needs is a small spark and it could blow. 
The late Trinidadian intellectual and activist C.L.R. James continuously emphasised the importance of spontaneity, or as he put it, the free creative activity of the proletariat. And sure enough, two months after I spoke to Escalar, uh, Spanish youth occupied the main squares across the country, rallying to the slogan, we are not good in the hands of politicians and bankers. And they would become known as the Indignados, and formed the basis for a new political party, Podemos, which has been in government, the Socialist Party. So that notion of combustibility, <clears throat> of a latent constituency in a volatile social moment susceptible to provocation that might explode into a full bone political uprising has been ever present from the LA riots of 65 to the Arab Spring of 2010. As the 18th century French philosopher Montesquieu argued, if a particular cause, like the accidental result of a battle, has ruined the state, it was a general cause which made the downfall of this state ensue from a single battle. In other words, there's always some oil on the ground, and the sparks that ignite it aren't <coughs> exactly random. In this case, there were instead a small number of people with phones whose names may be known, but are similarly not remembered, or are certainly not remembered, who recorded this moment, George Floyd's moment, and then put it onto their social networks with the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And so the video of his killing in Minneapolis went viral, clearly tapping into a well of outrage and injustice that crossed races, generations, and nations. Within a couple of days, there were Black Lives Matter protests across the country, in every state, both rural and urban areas, which spread almost instantaneously to pretty much every country, from Iceland and Helsinki to Colombia and Krakow. It's worthwhile just taking a step back to reflect on the etymology of that hashtag Black Lives Matter. Because like most origin stories, it's a little messy, but instructive. It began not with the police shooting, but with the judicial acquittal of George Zimmerman, a civilian who shot their train on Martin. When Zimmerman was found innocent of murder, Alicia Garcia, domestic workers' rights organizer, was shocked by the mixture of cynicism and respectability politics on her Facebook feed, and she penned a love letter to black people. And in her final post wrote, black people, I love you, I love us, our lives matter. Her close friend, Patrice Khan Cullors, an anti-police violence organizer in LA, responded to the post writing, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Then their friend, Opal Tometi, an immigration rights worker in Phoenix, Arizona, contributed her support. But it would be another year after the police shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson in 2014 that the hashtag really took off. Now, the work that these women were doing prior to this moment, campaigning for domestic workers, immigrant rights and against police violence, is important because it gives a clearer sense of what a term like Black Lives Matter has been able to achieve and what that latent community looked like. There were a range of local anti-racist movements of various infrastructural capacities and views already doing work on the ground. And they rallied together in that moment under a banner, Black Lives Matter. And this was then replicated in cities across the country. So the extent to which the events of 2020 were a moment they were not a one-off. They were, at the very least, the latest in a series of moments, which were clearly and logically connected, um, that clearly and logically connected the span for the best part of a decade. And they were bound together by the lethal use of state violence against black people in the US that found echoes elsewhere. As such, I think it makes more sense to think of Black Lives Matter as a floating signifier than a single movement can attach itself to quickly cohered coalitions on the ground. One might understand it less um, as a movement in itself than a constellation of pre-existing movements brought together in and for a moment, or indeed several moments. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there are benefits. This flexibility makes it possible to respond quickly and with complete local autonomy. The lack of formal structure or leadership means they don't have to wait for a big shot to sign off on a protest or swoop in and give 
the action's credibility. They can adapt their demand to the place and the time rather than being hogtied by resolutions that may not apply or take orders from a person who doesn't understand the specific conditions. This, I believe, is what allowed Black Lives Matter to, to travel so freely <coughs> across the globe, pollinating the seeds of anti-racism in a range of different kinds of soil and then leaving it to grow according to the local climate. In Belgium, they defaced the statues of King Leopold. In the Netherlands, the conversation turned to Santa Claus racist sidekick, Sparta <coughs> Pete. In Britain, Colston's statue was thrown in the harbour. Now, I want to dwell on these targets for a moment, because in Britain, at least, it's left the anti-racist community open to the chance that it's far more interested in symbolic change that might be prone to what is described as culture war. And it's worth unpacking that for a moment. Because if you would ask black people in Bristol, what are the three issues in which you feel the greatest sense of inequality and exclusion prior to those demonstrations? I doubt that most of them would have said statues. Chances are they would have highlighted the same kind of things that most people do, education, employment, housing, healthcare. I doubt public art would have come up. So why target statues? Well, first of all, remember, there is no Black Lives Matter organization as such. I will come back to that. So no organization had decided that these things are a priority. We're back to spontaneity again. But the statues in question of slave traders, war criminals, torturers, and in some cases, mass murderers, are understood as symbols of a society that denigrates black people and devalues their lives. Now, you're not gonna get rid of discrimination in housing, education, or employment overnight, but what you can do is pull down a statue. You can take a knee, you can raise a fist, you can, in a range of ways, make your opposition known. And this led many, including the England football team, open to the charge of gesture politics. Now, from the right, I think this is a very odd term. The British government spent £163,000 on flags in just two years, a massive increase on previous years. How is that not gesture politics? If the England football team raised their arms to a Zeke higher before every game, that too would be gesture politics. But I don't think anyone would say it didn't mean anything. There is a considerable amount of performance in politics. So it seems peculiar to hone in on one, taking a knee or raising a fist, in particular in single out was irrelevant. Nonetheless, the charge does focus on a crucial point. Have the events of the last few years or so changed anything? Or have they just given people an opportunity to make their opposition known? Has it provided us with new rituals but no change? What were the achievable demands of Black Lives Matter? Defunding the police, dismantling white supremacy are slogans, they're not demands. What change were they seeking? Whom were they seeking it from? How did they um, propose to achieve it? Taking a knee is arguably easy. We could all do it right now. Some of us have a bit more trouble getting up than others, but we could all do it right now if we want to. Dismantling systemic racism is hard. It takes years and fierce political battles. Maybe we're not up to that. Well, the first thing to acknowledge is that the one thing that it did change was people's minds. Black Lives Matter changed people's minds. According to YouGov pollsters, the proportion of Britons who think the Metropolitan Police is institutionally racist or the minorities are discriminated against in the workplace has gone up since the protests. Ipsos Mori poll. Um, from May 2021 showed that more than half of British people think we need to do more to tackle racism against just 13% who think we're doing too much. After almost a year of Black Lives Matter protests, statement making, knee taking and so on, one third of people thought we weren't talking about racism enough. And another third felt that we were talking about just enough. These protests also embolden black people to challenge racism and to seek more change. Uh, in that August, significantly, more than half saw taking the knee as important in tackling racism in football. In March of that year, it was barely over a quarter. 
Another YouGov poll taken after the 2020 Euros final showed a third of people who previously didn't think racism was a problem in football did following the final. Now, if these changes in opinion are sustainable, and it appears they are, then those are significant achievements. It's possible to change laws and practices without changing people's minds. But then those legal advances are vulnerable to backlash. But by changing people's minds, you change the culture. And you lay the groundwork for significant changes in policy for the future, as well as for a new anti-racist consensus. This is not a zero-sum game in which you either change minds or change laws. The two are symbiotic. But what one cannot do is dismiss the changing of minds as irrelevant and the changing of laws as paramount. It's true that symbols shouldn't be mistaken for substance, but they should never be dismissed as insubstantial either. These symbolic actions brought the issue into people's homes and forced a response. They provided theatre, if not drama. Not everybody liked it, but it forced a conversation and apparently reflection. Nobody is seriously arguing to put Colston's statue back up. So to recap, we are talking about at least several moments of potent symbolism that changed people's minds about racism in Britain. Well, I guess how many moments does it take to make a movement? And what does it matter if we understand it as a social movement or not? We've established that there are benefits to being without a leader or a structure in the speed and the flexibility with which these uh, formations work. You can act without institutional restraint. You are primed for moments of spontaneity. It is also true that the formations that emerged were more likely to have women and queer people in their leadership. It is, I don't think, a coincidence that the three people I mentioned who started um, Black Lives Matter were all relatively young women. That you don't have the institutional stasis of um, patriarchy and heteronormativity, which has certain people, men, um, particularly straight men, dominating uh, uh, meetings in a particular way. But there was a downside to this flexibility and porousness too, because the absence of structures also means a lack of democracy, clear direction, consistency, or permanence. If you wanted to join Black Lives Matter, and here I'm making a guess, but I guess this is a reasonable guess. If you wanted to join Black Lives Matter in Milton Keynes, where would you go? Who would you talk to? What would that even look like? Is there a website, an email address. I know there's not a building. So when I'm, I'm, um, I'm minded of a conversation I had with a colleague of the Guardian who was close to Jeremy Corbyn, not long after Corbyn won the leadership of the Labour Party. And I said to him, why aren't they doing that? Or why did they do that? And we're talking like a couple of weeks after, and it was a real mess. Why didn't they do that? Why? And he said, he laughed and he said, you're assuming that there's a day. There is no day. Jeremy got rid of his uh, comms person the day after the election, a contract ran out. It's just Jeremy and John and whoever else is in the room. You know, when we reflect on why that didn't work, <laughs> um, we might stop at some of those uh, stories. And when people say, why don't Black Lives Matter do X or Y, or what do they think about this or that? It's worthwhile asking, well, who, who are you talking about? What is it that you are talking about? What, what, what do you imagine this to be? What at first appeared solid melted into air, to paraphrase Mark, a very different subject. There are a number of anti-racist and community organizations that you might work with and that pre-existed that moment. And in many towns and cities, ad hoc Facebook groups formed 
calling themselves Black Lives Matter, but there was no quality control or ideological coherence. Anyone with uh, uh, Wi-Fi can do it. One group whose members are mostly based in London, who called themselves Black Lives Matter UK, and launched some action several years ago before going dormant, put up a GoFundMe, and they raised more than a million pounds after George Floyd was killed. That group is no more than about 20 people. They took themselves by surprise. Since raising the money, which they still have, none of the money we're missing, they've been struggling to work out how to organize themselves to distribute it. Compare this for a moment, and this isn't a claim about how good things were, it's about how different things were. To the March on Washington in 63, which starts with a black trade unionist, A. Philip Randolph, calling for a march, and the main, main civil rights organizations all rejecting it. And then church led demonstrations in Birmingham, Alabama, creating a global spectacle of the vicious racism across the US. And then Bayard Rustin, a brilliant gay ex communist organizer, dedicated to planning a march because the marches in, in Birmingham which were organized by the 16th Street Baptist Church leader, Fred Shuttlesworth, have become such a global spectacle that now they can't not have a march. They have to direct all of this anger. Resolutions are passed. Trains and coaches are hired. Such was the nature and power and capacity of social movements as we knew them. Now, that was a long time ago in a different countries, but more recently here, there was CND, which had chapters in different towns, or anti-apartheid, or anti-poll tax unions. Formations would make sure that all that was solid did not melt into air, that they saved some for later. Once again, this isn't a lamentation. It's a recognition of how things have changed. Um, a range of people, many young and inexperienced, in the moment of George Floyd's murder, <coughs> took up the mantle and they did very, very impressive work. But in the absence of any institutional capacity in Britain, they found themselves at the head, at the virtual head of a huge and unwieldy cacophony of interest and demands with no infrastructure or support. They rose to the immediate challenge admirably, but there is, of course, challenges. There are, of course, challenges beyond the immediate. A range of institutions made high-minded statements about Black Lives Matter, but how does one hold them to account without a Black Lives Matter? The leader of the opposition took a knee, but how could he be held to account? What were the demands? Where was a roadblock? These are all relevant questions to which there's no real answer, facts of which we should be aware, but not despair. No energy is ever lost. And it's also important to acknowledge that there were no shortage of demands that already existed. There are already people campaigning to get rid of stop and search. That organization exists. Oh, those organizations exist. There are organizations calling for the abolition of the gangs matrix. There was the Lamy Review on racial disparities in the criminal justice system, the Timpson Review, school exclusions, the McGregor Smith Review on race in the workplace, Sven Linquist, and exterminate all the groups. Does you already know enough? So do I. It's not knowledge that we lack. What is missing is the courage to understand what we know and to draw conclusions. Maybe these moments gave us courage, but we shouldn't pretend that just because they didn't make demands, therefore they weren't serious because the demands already existed and were already being made. And with it being a floating signifier, it could be attached to that signifier. Now, I don't think that this issue that Black Lives Matter has, its porous, um, uh, unstructured state, is specific to race. I actually think it reflects the nature of modern progressive social movements, from Occupy Wall Street to Me Too. Because, um, like Black Lives Matter, where racism is a global phenomenon, there's no place on earth that doesn't know inequality or sexual harassment. So 
Occupy Wall Street meeting and translate it easily. Occupy Wall Street found homes like Black Lives Matter all over the world. There were encampments in Vancouver and Boston and Bournemouth, and now it's gone. The trouble is that the trouble was that there was something very fleeting about it. And over the past decade or two, I would say, there has been this homeless drifting quality to progressive movements, each one more powerful and hopeful than the last, galvanizing new growing and overlapping constituencies, each too narrowly focused and lacking the social or economic base to sustain themselves, often ca caffeinated through social media, which left them burning brightly only to fade, making space for whatever came next, each having to create new structures, practices, goals and methods from scratch. And once again, this comes by way of less of criticism than description, because they mobilized and energized large groups of people, transformed the political conversation and laid out uh, alternative visions for how the world might be understood. And that is no small thing, but they created ideological space that I believe they couldn't hold politically. And so for all the consciousness they raised, the base that they shifted and the influence that they have, we find ourselves in some regards politically on the black on the black foot, repelling deportations to Rwanda and rollbacks on the Windrush scandal victims with yet another wave of austerity. We have, to put it concisely, a sharper consciousness of the defeats that we are enduring. Once again, this is a description rather than blame, whatever you call them, however you understand them, moment, movement, symbol or substance. What you can't say is that they didn't make a difference. White House Communications Director for Barack Obama told a report in 2012 that Occupy Wall Street had reframed the discussion nationally because it gave people permission to openly discuss something that has not really been openly discussed. That thing was capitalism. In DC, where women's marches have been the biggest of all, the decade ended with more women elected to Congress than ever before. But it started with a rollback on abortion. They also started to reshape the political parties that existed. Previously centrist social democratic parties either went radical shifts to the left, Labour with Corbyn, the Democrats with Sanders, or were eclipsed by the left in Greece, France and the Netherlands, which often supported coalitions or minority governments. So space was created, but then look at Labour or the Democrats or Syria now. In other words, for all the flaws, these are, for all their flaws, these interventions did have an impact, albeit one that is difficult to track. They broadened the branches of debate emboldened many who previously felt isolated and raised general awareness of inequalities and inequities that had either been ignored or about which people have become cynical. The radical Brazilian educator Paulo Freire once asked, what can we do today so that tomorrow we can do what we were unable to do today? Now these movements shifted what would be possible tomorrow. Which brings us back to that day at Newington Green, uh, 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 the, the first story that I told, which for all its arguable flaws and omissions made a difference, even if it's not yet entirely clear what that difference is, how it will manifest or who it will impact. The world is a different and I believe a better place because it happened than if it hadn't. If we think of political activism as less transactional or causal, and more procedural, contextual and organic, then we should have confidence in its potential, even as we critique its limitations. There is oil on the ground. We don't yet know where the next spark will come from, but we must find ways to learn from those who walk through the flames before us. Because while we have cleared space, we have yet to find an efficient and durable way to build them.